Metonymy is a figure of speech in which a related term is substituted for the word itself. Often the substitution is based on a material, causal, or even conceptual relation between the things. What's interesting about metonymy is that it's a rhetorical device that is often used in everyday speech. It's one of those classic devices that people use but don't know that it has a specific nomenclature. So metonymy can create several effects for an author. Uh, firstly, it can make concrete objects appear more abstract or archetypical. Uh, that effect sounds like a metaphor, but it's important to note that metonymy and metaphor create comparisons differently. I'll talk more about that later, um, but for now you can consider metonymy unique because of the contiguity it creates. Contiguity uh, connects related notions, or if you really want to be fancy about it, it creates semantic or even pragmatic connections between two things, or two words. The third effect is the most obvious and practical for the student of literature. Metonymy can remove the formality of language, and this is where you might make the connection between the literary term and everyday speech. You'll see some examples later of the connection between metonymy and colloquial language, which illustrate how the device can be used to familiarize or colloquialize the language of a text. So, effectively, an author can use metonymy to manipulate the tone of a text. Uh, they can use it to play with characterization or dialogue. Um, and they can use metonymy to distinguish narration. Metonymy is an umbrella term, and you'll find that there are specific types of metonymy within that term. So I'm going to draw your attention to three major uses of metonymy today. The first is called containment. It's a type of metonymy that is based upon one thing containing another thing. So uh, an example of this could be when you use the word dish to refer not to the plate itself, but the food it contains. So in a sentence it would be, I enjoyed the entire meal, but that third dish was my favorite. Uh, synecdoche is when a part, specific part of the thing is used to represent the whole. An example of this would be calling police officers the law. So in a sentence that would be, I tried to get into the speakeasy, but the law was waiting for me on the other side of the door. It's really important to note that the difference between general metonymy and a synecdoche is a part of the whole, while metonymy is just a simple association between the two words. I would probably argue that synecdoche is the most common form of metonymy, but there are obvious you know, examples of other types. The last one I wanted to draw your attention to is toponyms. Toponyms can be seen as a type of metonymy or even as a specific type of uh, synecdoche. Toponyms are geographically based, so places become representative of an abstract concept. An example of this could be um, the term Madison Avenue. Uh, that's representative of the entire advertising industry. It doesn't just take into account, you know, the advertising firms and their offices that exist in New York City on that particular street. Um, I want to have you take a look at this classic line of Shakespearean dialogue from Act 3, Scene 2 of Julius Caesar. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Now, to best understand Mark Antony's meaning, you can analyze this line in three separate ways. Let's look at it first um, metonymically. You can see that two specific words can be interpreted as metonyms. Ears is representative of a person's attention, and lend can now include non-material objects. So essentially the line is asking the audience to pay attention if you approach it metonymically. The second way you could approach it is uh, simply literally. Um, so the speaker is saying, please remove your ears so that I can take them with me for a time, um, which should be given its, its due for a very short time before we come to the conclusion that such a line and interpretation probably don't fit the context of what's going on in the scene. The third uh, way that you can approach this, this line is metaphorically. In this case, the line means that the speaker wants the listeners to physically turn their ears in the direction of the speaker. It's difficult to say with absolute certainty which interpretation Shakespeare would have had in mind, though I think we can fairly say the chances of the second are not as high as the first or the third. And it's a really good example um, when considering metonymy because it illustrates how metonymy informs meaning differently than metaphor informs meaning. 
It also illustrates how metonymy and metaphor can work together seamlessly. One can have multiple interpretations of the text and still appreciate the validity of those interpretations as individual entities or parts of a single interpretation because it ultimately makes the meaning of the line more nuanced. Take a look at these examples and see if you can classify each type of metonymy as containment, synecdoche, or toponymy. If you have any questions, please leave comments below.